Um, I'm okay. Do you want any water? No, no, I'm okay. So let's get started. It is our pleasure to have here uh, Dr. Joseph Torella Torres from uh, UIUC. Um, he's here as part of the John Postel uh, Distinguished Lecturer Series. Dr. Torres is a, a fellow of the IEEE and ACM and is actually the director of not one but two centers at UIUC, the Center for Programmable Extreme Scale Computing and the Illinois Intel Parallelism Center. Uh, <coughs> this coming year he has three papers accepted at ASPLOS, four at HPCA, and I think you have to get five now at ISCA to make the, the, tr the hat trick. Um, <laughs> but it's uh, an impressive record, um, and uh, it's really an honor to have him here uh, speaking with us today. So please help me welcome Dr. Torres. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? So thank you, Glenn. Thank you, faculty. Thank you, students, for inviting me to this lecture and for coming to the talk. It turns out that it's about 20 years since I last visited UCLA, and I'm enjoying every minute of the visit. OK, so thank you. So in this talk, I will give you an overview of the work that I'm doing with my graduate students on extreme scale computer architecture, or designing computers for energy efficiency from the ground up. At any time, please stop me if you have any questions. So I welcome questions during the talk. So let's first start with looking at the state of the art. What's the state of the art? Let's take a Power 7 IBM processor. This is a processor that was announced in 2010. And it has eight cores, 32 threads total. If you put four of these Power, 4, Power 7 processors in a multi-chip module, you get a system that it advertises you get a one teraflop peak performance at the cost of 800 watt. Now you put eight of those and you get a server. And then from here you build on until you get to the pet scale machine that was supposed to be a Illinois, the Blue Water supercomputer. That was a machine that was supposed to be a one petaflop machine, right? and optimistically was supposed to consume 10 to 20 megawatt. So just to give you a sense of how much power this is, 20 megawatt is about $20 million per year in electricity alone. Okay? And close to Champaign, we have a big nuclear power station in Clinton, and that power station is 1,000 megawatt. Okay? So with 50 of these machines, we consume all the power that this huge nuclear power station is able to produce. So it's clear from here that this is not sustainable. Power and energy are the real limitations in today's computer architecture. Okay? So that's the real problem. What we want, and this is a problem for all computer architects, is to design energy efficient computers. And that's why we the community came up with the term extreme scale computing. Extreme scale doesn't have anything to do with the size. It doesn't apply just to high-end systems. Extreme scale computers are computers that are 100 to 1,000 times more capable than current machines for the same power consumption and for the same physical footprint. So energy efficiency and footprint are the keywords. So for the 20 megawatt that you saw before, now you get a machine that is a thousand times more powerful, an exascale machine. That's something that DOE is very interested in nowadays. But if you want a petascale machine, then it should consume only 20 kilowatt, thousand times less, and take a space equal to a departmental server only. And going down, you would get a terascale portable device that consumes 20 watt. This is a very ambitious goal, right? Let's compare to the state of the art. Okay? If you do the numbers, we set 20 watt per teraop sustained. And that means that every single operation, on average, can take at most 20 picojoules. That's a very small amount of energy. 20 picojoules, it takes, you want to have 20 picojoules to say, do a multiplication. Read the operands, the two operands from memory or the cache, do the multiplication and store the result. If we compare this to the IBM Power 7, an MCM, we said, has 800 watt for one teraflop. This doesn't seem that different. But the difference here is that this is peak. 
and peak in IBM parlance means I'm just doing multiplications and additions. Okay? And that's not what we're interested in. The challenge is, is machines spend most of the energy transferring data. Okay? Once you have a large machine with multiple chips, all the energy goes into accessing another chip, memory, and so on. So minimizing the energy in data transfer, not in the ALU operations, is the real challenge in computing. And therefore, we are far from the current state of the art. As I said, we are two to three orders of magnitude. It's interesting to know how we got into this problem. So let me recap here for you guys, why do we get into the problem of energy and power? In the last, well, many years ago, we had something called uh, the ideal scaling or the NART scaling, which meant that at every semiconductor generation, all the dimensions, dimension one became 0.7. So if I had a transistor that had a dimension of 1, it became 0.7. If I had a trans the area of the transistor became 0.7 times 0.7, so that means half. Whatever take one unit of area, now it's half of the area. Okay? The supply voltage also went 0.7. The capacitance went to 0.7. The frequency is the inverse of 0.7, because now it's, it has to, the signal has to travel a shorter distance, so it's 1.4. And so that was the ideal scaling. If you look at the dynamic power, dynamic power is proportional to the capacitance, voltage square, and frequency. Now, if in one generation we have a certain number of transistors that use a certain area, the amount of power density is given by C V square F divided by A. If we go to the next generation, then all these transistors fit in half the area, 0.7 square. But if you look at the power density, it stays constant. If you do the math here, 0.7 C, because C becomes 0.7 C, 0.7 square B square, 1.4 F and so on, you get constant density. So traditional scaling says, you go from one generation, the next generation, the thing gets shrunk by half, and the power density is constant. This is not optimal, but it's very good. Okay? You could reduce the size of the chip and still keep the density constant. Unfortunately, this is not what's happening. Okay? What's happening, this is constant power density, what's happening is what we call real scaling. In real scaling, the supply voltage doesn't change or it changes very, very slowly. The reason is that if I reduce the supply voltage, the closer it gets to the, a parameter that's called the threshold voltage of a transistor, the transistor becomes slow. In fact, the delay of a transistor is inversely proportional to the difference between the, the supply voltage and the threshold voltage. Okay? So designers and manufacturers have been very reluctant to reduce the voltage because then it becomes slow transistors. And if I don't reduce the voltage by 0.7, right, then my dynamic power doesn't reduce. And so what happens here is that dynamic power actually increases with a smaller technology. And on top of that, I have a new term that is the static power. So there's dynamic power, which is the, the power that you consume as you do work, Static power is the power that you consume just because you're there, you leak. Okay? So if you sum the two things together, the total power goes up. And that is the big problem. That's why architects consider power efficiency as the number one goal these days. So power density increases. So how do we design computers? And that's the reason. Why do we design computers from the ground up for power efficiency. And how do we do it? We need to come up with new designs for large chips. I'm gonna talk about a chip that has a thousand processors. Okay? How do we design it? We need new ways of orga organizing and architecting such a chip. Okay? We need to have efficient support for high concurrency and we need to have the ability to minimize the data transfer. At the same time, we hope to, hope to leverage new technologies that will be coming online in the next few years. Specifically, the ability to work at low supply voltage. 
the uh, ability to have efficient regulation of the voltage on chip, 3D die stacking, resistive memory, photonic interconnects, and so forth. So why not? These are technologies that will help us increase the efficiency of computers. In this talk, I will focus mostly on this part here, the architecture, and some of the technology aspects. This work will be, I'm going to explain this work in the context of what we call the Thrifty Multiprocessor. This is our research vehicle. The Thrifty Multiprocessor is an extreme scale multiprocessor that is funded by DOE, DARPA, and NSF. And it's very similar to the Runnymede processor that Intel is building. Okay, so I'm part of this team, the Intel team, that was building the Runnymede project. And this is a project led by Intel and funded by DARPA under the ubi ubiquitous high performance computing uh, program. We wrote a paper that will appear at HPCA in a few months um, in the industrial track of the conference where it explains the architecture of the, of the Runamit processor. But now you're going to get some preview because it's just very similar architecture. Okay? So in the rest of the talk, I'll give you some idea of some of the projects that my students have been working on to give you a flavor of, of what are the challenges in de designing a very power efficient machine. Okay? Um, of course, Intel engineers are working on similar projects, but other areas. Okay? Any questions so far? No? Okay. So, a theme of this work will be operating at low supply voltage. So, why is it so important? to operate at low VDD. It's because reducing the VDD is the biggest lever that we have as designers to reduce, to have an energy efficient design. It turns out that with lower VDD, you have a big reduction in dynamic power. If you remember CV square F, square at least, right? And then the static power is also more than linear on VDD. So if you reduce the voltage, Right there, you decrease the, the power significantly. We would like to reduce the supply voltage close to the threshold voltage. Okay? As you know, the problem is that the systems get slow. Okay? But so we're going to try to reduce it in, in an area that's called near threshold voltage. Okay? Perhaps 550 millivolts as opposed to the 1 volt or 900 millivolts that current processors operate on. Okay? And what are the trade-offs here? The first thing is that as you decrease the voltage so much, you get a huge reduction in power consumption. You get a reduction more than 40x, okay, if we trust the, the expectation. So that chip now consumes 40 times less power, at least, than before. Okay, so it's a very good deal. Unfortunately, it comes with some problems. One of the problems is lower speed. So we're going to have to deal with a tenfold reduction in speed. I think the times are over for these 5 gigahertz processors, 4 gigahertz processors. The future is probably more into 1 gigahertz or lower, okay? if we want power efficiency. And we're going to have to deal with more parallelism to make up for this loss of frequency. And second, the big problem that occurs is that as you reduce the voltage, you have more process variation, okay? more parameter variation. Parameter variation is the changes in the properties of transistors away from their nominal values. Okay? And this occurs because as you decrease the voltage so close to the threshold voltage, then small changes in the threshold voltage suddenly have a huge effect on the external behavior of the, the transistor. So the first thing that we did is try to understand the effect of parameter variation in such an environment. Okay? And what we did is, let me give you the basics of parameter variation so that you can follow up the rest of the talk. Parameter variation is the deviation of device parameters from nominal specifications. So for example, you get a transistor, the designers designed this transistor for a threshold voltage of say 0.33 millivolts, 0.33 volts, 
And now we have this chip with millions of transistors and some of them go to 0.5 volts and others go to 0.2 volts. Okay, that's process variation, parameter variation. Okay. Now, parameter variation has two unfortunate effects. One is that the chip becomes slower and the second is that the chip consumes more power. Okay, let me tell you why. The first thing is why does a chip with process variation consume or run slower? It's because if I have the distribution of the logic paths in a processor, okay, say you have this curve, this is the number of critical paths or number of paths, and this is the delay or latency of, say, a path, right? Initially you have this curve, and now if you put process variation, some of the paths become slower, some others become faster. So you get this distribution, right? But unfortunately, the processor has to cycle at the frequency of the slowest paths. So the critical path is determined by, by the, the period of the slowest path in the pipeline. So suddenly, even though I have faster paths as well, the processor frequency has to go down. Yes? Is that the reason to look more into asynchronous designs? Well, so, so there are always people who want to have asynchronous designs, but, but there are trade-offs as well, right? One of the problems of asynchronous design is speed, now becomes slower. So certainly people talk more about this. The other problem is that you consume more power. Why would it be that? Why you consume more static power? Because, so let's say that the nominal threshold voltage is this one, but you get some transistors that have high threshold voltage, and this guy leak less, and some transistors have low threshold voltage, and those guys leak more. The problem is that the power dissipated follows an exponential curve, which means that those that leak less save less power than the power consumed by those that leak more. Okay, it's the exponential behavior. So the result is that this chip will consume more static power. And what's worse is that for the same process variation, the same variation in threshold voltage, you have a higher variation in frequency and power at near threshold voltage. Okay? And I said this why before, is that the voltage gets so close that small variations now are more visible. If the voltage was this high, small variations would not affect it so much. So all the rest of the work if you want to work in this area, you have to understand process variation. And so the first thing that we did is we developed a model of process variation for computer architects. We call this various NTV. And it's an architectural model tailored for near threshold voltage. What we do is we start with some parameters that you can get from the international roadmap for semiconductors, or you can get it from Intel and other companies. And from there, we build the distribution of parameters such as the threshold voltage of the chip of the transistors or the length of the channel. And from there, we're able to also generate, if we have this was the original distribution of the critical paths, now we got this distribution. And with this model, you can also say, if instead of cycling the processor at this higher period, I insist on having this period, which is the period I had before, before variation, then the probability of a timing error is proportional to the area under this curve. Okay? So then this model also gives you what is the probability of a timing error if you work at this frequency or at this other frequency or if you reduce the voltage and so on. So for computer architects, that's useful because it allows you to do a trade-off between the power dissipated and the errors hmm, that you expect to get. And then we also model the failure of SRAM cells, all the types of failures here. So this is a model that you can use okay, if, if for, for your research. Any questions? Yes. Beyond 
Okay. Because these curves are not static paths. These are dynamic paths. So you run an application, right? And if this program exercises this path a thousand times, it counts for more than the others. So these are dynamic paths. So if I use static paths, you're right. That wouldn't be the area. But if you give me an application, and then I profile and I figure out all the dynamic paths, this is the error rate. OK? Any other questions? So. We use this model to understand what is the effect of process variation on our thrifty chip. So here is our thrifty chip. It's a chip with a thousand cores, and it's organized in clusters. Each cluster is composed of eight processors, with each processor has its own local memory, and then there is a cluster memory, okay? And this is basically replicated as many times until you get the whole system. And we use the model to figure out what is the impact of process variation on the chip. So what we have here is we're trying to compare the effect of process variation on NTV and on a conventional processor, supposing that this chip was operated at a voltage comparable to current voltages, say 0.9 volts. Okay? And so what we have here is, say, two bars the near threshold voltage variation and the conventional processor. Okay? And each of the bars are as follows. I'm going to try to explain this. So for intracore, what we did is we considered one of these clusters and we figured out which one is the fastest core, okay? the one that has, can cycle at the highest frequency and the one that can cycle at the lowest frequency. And we took the ratio. Okay? And the ratio gives us a measure of the variation inside one of these clusters. And then we average out across all the clusters. This is the ratio for the conventional case. And this is the ratio for near threshold voltage. Okay? This corresponds to 11 nanometers, so machine later on in this decade. So you can see that we get more variation in a near threshold voltage, as expected, than a conventional machine. This is for the memory speed. So what we do is we take the fastest local memory and the lowest local memory, whatever it is, we take the ratio of the frequencies, and then we average out across all the clusters, and we get this thing here. And this corresponds to the cluster memory. All the cluster memories, max speed to lowest speed. So you can see that, basically, we get a larger variation in frequency as we move to lower voltages, which makes sense. That memories are more vulnerable, as we move to memories, because the critical paths have fewer transistors. So they cannot average out their random effects. And also, if I could do the same thing for power, you would see even more differences. This is something that computer architects will have to deal with. A chip will not be uniform. It's not uniform already today, but as we move forward even less, some parts of the chips will be faster than others, consume more power than others. The use of this model, oh, any questions? The use of this model has allowed us to understand many of the problems in one of these thousand core chips. For example, so nowadays people use voltage domains to operate chips. So a voltage domain is an area of the chip where you assign a certain voltage, and another area of the chip will have a different voltage. Okay? So current chips may have two or four of these voltage domains, and people use this to run the critical applications perhaps at high voltage, or perhaps to run the slowest part of their chip at a high voltage and the slowest part at low voltage. Okay? Sorry, opposite. The fastest part at low voltage. But what we found is that if you move to this thousand core chip at near threshold voltage, the dividing the chip into these voltage domains is hardly cost effective. Okay, and I'll try to explain why. And this is counterintuitive, because one would think that as you want more and more power efficiency, then having these different domains would make sense. So the first problem with having multiple voltage domains is that 
on-chip regulators, which are, the, which are the devices that are allowing you to have a different voltage in each part of the chip, come with a significant power cost. Okay? So you need a power regulator, voltage regulator, in each of these voltage domains. And these designs waste about 10% of the power. Just regulating the power, you waste 10% on the chip. Okay? So that means this is hardly, hardly a good deal whenever you want to design machines with power efficiency as the main constraint. The second problem with multiple voltage domains is that in this large machine, you're not going to have a voltage domain for each of the clusters. Instead, you will organize groups of clusters, like in this case here, you're going to put groups of clusters into the same domain. Okay? You're going to have fewer, otherwise it would be too costly. And that means that the different processors inside the cluster will have variation, and therefore you're already losing some of the effect of this. So it gets watered, watered down a little bit by having multiple clusters inside the same domain. And another problem is that if you have a small domain, you are more susceptible to voltage noise. What's this problem? The problem is that whenever you have processors that start doing computation, they increase the current intake. And then when they wind down the computation, they stop consuming. That means big changes in current. Okay? And that causes big changes in the voltage. There is this jump in the voltage. This is called voltage droops. If I have a big chip with a single domain, there is an averaging out effect. Well, some processes may be working, others are idle, and so on. If instead I have a very small domain, then there is less capacitance, and there is a bigger chance of either consuming a lot of power, a lot of current suddenly, and then dropping the voltage, and so on. And what designers do is then they increase the guard band of the voltage, which means I pad the voltage with some guard band to be safe. So that if I could do it with, say, 0.5 volts, I go to 1.6. Because whenever there is one of these draws of current, I'm going to drop 10, uh, 100 millivolts, right? So we need to increase the guard band, and that immediately translates in, again, more losses. So instead, what we propose is to have a single voltage domain. And this comes as a counterintuitive thing and single voltage domain. And the idea is to have simple hardware with a single voltage domain and simple and effective core allocation. So here's the idea. We're going to have different frequencies for each of the clusters. That's fine. But a single voltage across the whole system. Okay? And then each cluster is a frequency domain. And the allocation will be done in multiples of clusters. The idea here is to simplify the design. Okay? Allocation in units of multiples of clusters called ensembles. You want to work, I give you a cluster, or I give you another two clusters or three clusters. Okay? And they all run at the same frequency. And then we have a simple core allocator algorithm that assigns the right clusters, knowing the probability, the properties, the voltage and frequency properties of each of the clusters, right? And knowing the different needs of the jobs. The bottom line here is simplicity. By having simplicity, we eliminate the need to have the voltage domains, the regulators, and the result of this is that we get a more efficient chip. So if we plot here the MIPS per watt, that you get in your program, MIPS per watt is a measure of how energy efficient you're executing. Okay? It's the inverse of the energy consumed by the program. So we want to have higher values. Okay? So what I have here is a perfect environment where each of the clusters of the chip would be a different domain, voltage domain, voltage and frequency domain, but there would be no cost at all. None of the three costs that I described before would be paid. You would get an energy efficiency of one, say. Then, if you add the effect of the regulator power loss, you go down a little bit. 
depending on what is the efficiency of the regulator. So let's say 10% is the loss of the power, the voltage regulator, so you get to this point. Then we get to the point where we combine multiple cluster, four clusters into the same domain. So that thing goes down a little bit more. And then we have the problem of having to add the additional guard band in the voltage, in the voltage to stand droops in the voltage. And that brings the efficiency even lower here. And this is our simple design when we get to this point. So the result here is that with a single voltage domain, you get even more energy efficiency by having a clever scheduler. The moral of this is that simplicity is very important. Okay? A lot of the work that has been done making very elaborate designs, once we go into a very efficient energy efficiency environment, we want to strip it down. Hmm? Okay, any questions on this? Which one? This? No, this is one. This is one. This one? This one? Yes, because it's not optimal, right? So you have to basically put a global suboptimal voltage for the whole chip, right? While some parts could be cycling in a more. With frequency domains. You have different frequency domains, and therefore you have a scheduler that knows about different frequencies, but it optimizes for a single voltage. Oh, yeah. So Oft Okay, all the chips will have some off-chip regulator losses and some noise and losses there. So all of them have this thing, all of them. Okay, so we can quibble about the, quibble about the actual amounts, but it's all these schemes have some losses outside the chip, okay? Multi so frequencies have a problem if you have multiple frequencies also because you have to cross the thing and that means some performance cost. So it's accounted here. Okay? Remember, we're not measuring performance, we're measuring efficiency. That's MIPS or operations per watt. So what we learn from all this is that what we need really as technologies, we need efficient on chip voltage regulation. And we're working on a hierarchical design of voltage regulators, okay? This, the idea here is that we would have a first level voltage regulators, which would be put in a different die, not on the processor die, but on top of that, okay? They would translate off chip voltages to something that is close to the needs of the processors, and then have a second level voltage regulators that work, translate this small range from whatever this first level to what the processor needs. Okay? And that can be done at high efficiency and fast. Okay? So we expect in the future more elaborate designs. So companies are working on this. Another issue is we need energy efficient design wants to have short voltage guard bands. And what this means is that we need to be able to tackle voltage droops due to load variation. Somehow we need to have systems that are tolerant to these droops. Because in the future we're going to shave the guard bands as much as we can to have power efficiency. Okay? So that's one big part, which was circuits, devices. Now let's move on to the next level, which is architecture. If we look at one of these big chips, okay, let's say a thousand core chips, a lot of the power is wasted on leakage in the memory on chip, okay? So it turns out that as you reduce the voltage, a larger fraction of the power 
is static power than before. The reason is that the dynamic power decreases with the square, Cv square F. As you decrease the voltage, that dynamic power decreases faster and therefore you have a bigger fraction of the static or leakage power. The leakage power is consumed by area. So structures that take a lot of area consume more leakage. Turns out that one of these big thousand core chips, memories, will consume a lot of the area. And therefore, a lot of the power is consumed by this huge on-chip memories. Okay? So on-chip memory leakage is a major component. So what do we do? Currently, people propose coarse grain proposals, like disable the cache, disable a way of the cache, right? This is not going to work. The reason is that it is too coarse grain. How often you can say, I don't need any of the data of this cache, or I don't need anything from this way of the cache. Instead, what we need is to be able to power on only the lines that contain useful data. The rest, shut off. Okay? Now, the proposal that we use here, the proposal in our machine is to use on-chip memory technology that does not, does not leak. And that's why we use EDRAM. Okay, embedded DRAM. But of course, EDRAM, <coughs> EDRAM needs to be refreshed. Okay? So it doesn't leak, but it consumes power because you need to refresh it. So what we're going to do is we're going to have fine-grained, intelligent refresh of the on-chip memory. Okay? And there's a great opportunity here. And the great opportunity is that we have this chip that has a huge amount of memory, and at any time, only a very, very small fraction of the memory contains useful data. Or put it in other words, other words only a small fraction of this multi-megabyte last level cache contains data that the processors will bother to access in the very near future. Does this make sense? I have a multi-megabyte last level cache. How frequently am I accessing this data? Why do I need to keep refreshing? Or why does it need to keep leaking? Okay. So that's a major power savings opportunity. And what I'm going to show you is two techniques. Two techniques that we can use to reduce the wasteful leakage of DRAM. Yeah. So back when people were looking at the techniques for the disabled parts of the cacheways, they would over provision, right? They would provide many more cacheways than were necessary so they had an opportunity to turn things on. So if it's the case that most of this on-chip memory is useless, why is it provisioned in such a way that we have so much? It would seem like the thousand core chips would need that level of memory to be able to supply the bandwidth, to be able to hide that latency. So why isn't it useful? So maybe not all the applications are going to be underutilizing the memory. Okay? So yeah, therefore, you need schemes that are tolerant to this. They can adapt to the application needs. Okay? That's why you need to put some intelligence, as we will see. What I'm claiming, and I think maybe you will agree, is that for many applications, you're not using the whole memory all the time. And it's really a waste to have these guys leaking all the time. Right? And how often is it that you can disable the whole way? Right? You may need pieces there right, of data. And some of these pieces, yes, you could compress and move it into one way, but that requires moving data. Okay? So how do you eliminate useless refresh in this case. Okay? To understand the problem, let's use the following model. When does useless refresh happen? There are two types of lines that consume useless refresh. First are the cold lines. Cold lines are lines that are not used or used far apart in time. Let's say this, I access the line here, and this is the period where According to my refresh algorithm, I have to refresh every, say, 64 microseconds, right? This is a waste. If I'm not going to use it for a long time, I might as well let it decay or write it back to memory. So cold lines, big source of waste. But then there are the hot lines, lines that you access frequently. Those lines, every time you access, you effectively refresh them. So why, in addition to access them, you refresh them again? That is a waste. I access here, then I refresh. No need to refresh. When I accessed it, I already refreshed it. I do another access, another access, useless refresh, and so forth. Okay? So I have two types, the two extremes, cold lines and hot lines. 
those represent opportunities for removing the refresh. So the first scheme is called polyphase. Okay, and the idea here is to target both cold and, and, and hot lines. So how, how do we target hot lines? We divide the retention period. This is the retention period. Say, let's 64 microseconds. We divide the retention period into equal intervals called phases, or let's say four phases. Okay? And we're going to pay some extra area recording for each line the phase in which it was last accessed. Okay? Or refreshed. So this process, this line was accessed during phase one. Therefore, a line will be refreshed now only when the same phase arrives in the next retention period. So rather than refreshing this line that has been accessed here, here, I only refresh it when the next phase one arrives, which is this point. Okay? So this way, if a line is accessed frequently, I push the refresh further and further and further, and eventually I may not even refresh it. Make sense? So that's how I handle the hot lines. Okay? I pay with these extra bits, and I only push the refresh whenever it was a retention period away that you last access the line. What about code lines? I use the state of the line. I give, say, I only refresh valid lines. I don't bother refreshing invalid lines. Fine, because if they don't contain useful data, why bother? Okay? But for valid lines, excuse me, for valid lines, I'm going to have a timeout. I'm going to give a grace period to a line. If it hasn't been accessed, I'm going to still refresh it for a few retention periods, say, n retention periods. And after end retention periods, during which the line has not been accessed, I'm going to stop. Okay? That's this idea. In fact, for dirty lines, I'm going to refresh n times while they're not being accessed. And after that, if they're still not accessed, I'm going to write them back, and the line will become clean. And for clean lines, I'm going to refresh n times if they're not being accessed, accessed and after that, I'm going to invalidate and not bother refreshing anymore. Right? Questions? So that's the approach that I'm going to use. I'm going to save leakage in hot and cold lines. And this is the hardware. You would add this to the, the first part would be for the hot lines, this would be for the whole lines. I'm going to add this data structure in the cache controller. So the cache controller will keep for each line two bits that specify the phase in which it was last refreshed or accessed. Okay? And a valid bit. And so at the beginning of a phase, the controller needs to figure out which are the lines that it's their turn to be refreshed because they were accessed a retention period away ago. Right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a very efficient way of doing this. I'm going to read a whole row of, of bits. And if they're valid and their phase corresponds to the current phase, given by the global phase, then I'm going to request a refresh for them. Otherwise, not. Okay? And I need two bits per phase plus one valid. And then for the cold lines, once I decide which lines I need to refresh, I'm going to check what is the state of the line. If it's invalid, I don't care. That I knew already here. But I'm going to have this count that tells me how often since the line was last accessed. Remember, I had this count that says I'm going to give a grace period of n refreshes. So this thing will be decremented at every refresh and reset to a large value if it's accessed. And so then, as I'm about to refresh this thing, I'm going to decrement the counter, and when the counter reaches zero, I will either write back the line or invalidate. Make sense? So with this approach, at a certain cost, because I need to put all these structures, I'm able to reduce 40 to 60% of all the on-chip memory energy with practically no slowdown. Okay? So the idea is many of the lines are invalid, and are cold, those will be pushed away, and those that are hot, no need to refresh them. 
Well, this depends. This depends. Okay, so. So, so it depends. It depends on what is the voltage, right? For low voltage, you have more leakage. So, you know, I hesitate to give a number, but could be maybe thirty percent of all the cheap energy could come from from the memory hierarchy. Okay, thirty or forty percent maybe. Hmm? So that's one design but it comes at a cost. Now I'm gonna tell you a new idea that has really very little cost, and that is the fact we analyzed the data that IBM provided on the refresh properties of the DRAM. So if you look at the cells, a cells, I don't know if you can see this, but a cell has a transistor here, and then, sorry, this is the capacitor where you store the bit, and then a transistor, okay, an access transistor. Well. The current that goes through here is the leakage of the cell. And that's, you need to refresh to replenish this thing. Now, the leakage of the cell depends on the threshold voltage of this transistor. Now, IBM has a paper, 2008, that looks at the distribution of the retention time of the DRAM cells. Okay? This graph is a bit hard to explain. You have here the retention time. 100, this is 1,000 microseconds, so that's 1 millisecond, 10 millisecond, 100, and so forth. And this is the number of cells that have this retention. Okay? But it's not given as number. It's given as sigmas, sigma from the mean, which means this is the mean at zero. Okay? So the average cell is about, say, 20 milliseconds. It can retain data for, 10, for 20 milliseconds. And as we move down this curve, then we have lower retention time, but the numbers become very small. Say, when you get to four sigmas from the mean, you already cover 99%. So very few cells have this very short retention period. Okay? This is what's called the bulk area. And then there is some outliers. These guys have very short retention time, but they are very, very, very few counting for 1% of all the cells in a big EDRAM. Okay. So what does this tell us? It tells us, first of all, that the retention times, most of them are a few tens, tens of milliseconds. So why do people refresh at 40 microseconds? To be safe. Okay? To be safe because of these outliers. Is this working? Yeah. Because of these guys, people move to refresh at 60 microseconds, 64, even though most of the cells support tens of milliseconds. Another thing that this IBM folks said is that the retention time is a function of the threshold voltage of the access transistor. Well, if that's the case, and it's actually log normal distribution, if that's the case, then the threshold voltage is a physical property that has a spatial locality which means that the transistors that are close by will have similar threshold voltage. Therefore, they have similar retention. So the retention period will also have a special locality. And that's the insight here, is that if the retention time has special locality, then I can be clever in terms of architecture. So here's the idea. This is the distribution of the retention times. Okay? This corresponds to this part here, the slope of this guy here, plus a few outliers, and then I get this thing here. It has special locality. There are areas in the chip that have high retention time, others that have low retention time. Okay? And now, if we break and we look at cache lines, a cache line needs to have the refresh of the, of the, the cell that has the lowest retention time. Hmm? So you have a cache line, then I have to refresh at the frequency of the one that this loses charge at the fastest rate. So that's why I have this color. Color darker means lower retention time. And if I group the lines into 16 or even 64, that's what I get. These were the outliers. Now they create tiles that need to be refreshed. But most of the tiles actually need to be refreshed infrequently. So what we have is a design that we break the, the memories into tiles and then we refresh 
basically. We profile and we say these tiles need to be refreshed at the millisecond level. And those, only these few, need to be refreshed at the microsecond level. So the bottom line is that we eliminate practically all the leakage by using this approach. Because most of the tiles can be refreshed very infrequently. So this is another example that shows you techniques that need to be very aggressive that can save power. Yeah. So these properties, threshold voltage and so on, have two components, systematic and random. So you're right. There is a component that is random. Okay? So it's not ideal. So you have in that area, even though systematically it was an area of high threshold voltage, there are additional components of randomness. So which means it's not as ideal as systematic only but you still have a component of spatial locality. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that it would be best if there was no random component. In reality, there is a random component. It may account for half, 50% of all the process variation. The more random effects you have, the less this will have an impact. The more, the more you'll have the worst case impacting the whole tile. What, sorry? Okay, ideally you would profile it once when you, when you build the system. And you have to profile it at different temperatures because it changes with temperature. But if the RAM ages, should this change? Well, so one could argue that yes. So you would have to be conservative, right? Or reprofile it after some use. So how you implement this thing is, is an open question. you are saving just the refreshing uh, power. Uh, is that uh, uh, directly equal to the leakage power, or there is any difference between them? By using DRAM, you have completely or eliminated most of the leakage. Well, that you are just uh, saving the refreshing power, right? That's correct. Yeah, but there will still be leakage. No, no. Because if you change the EDRAM to the emerging normal tile memory, then you don't need to refresh them, right? Then, in your opinion, it seems that uh, you can save all the leakage power? I don't think so. Because uh, there is still leakage pass from the power supply to the ground, uh, while the excess transistor and also the emerging uh, memory cell, right? Okay. So yeah. there will always be leakage. Okay, so certainly. By putting EDRAM, you don't eliminate all the leakage, but you cut it down maybe to a sixth or so relative to SRAM. Okay, so you cut a big, big, big chunk, say three fourths or, or, or even more, five sixths of the leakage disappears. Make sense? Uh, so you mean uh, when we change from S rank to E D rank? Correct, correct, uh, correct. Okay, okay. okay. And you reduce the refreshing power. For Using the this, rank. exactly. So if we put a change, uh, change E D rank to normal tile memory, then there will be much more. Because you True. Don't need to at all. Yeah, the problem is that non-volatile memory is a different technology, so you cannot mix it with processors, right? You need a different layer. But the EDRAM is also a different technology of the processor technology because EDRAM needs multiple yeah. Yeah, layers, but processor only needs one layer. So yes, there but are also yeah, challenges on the fabrication. There are challenges, but IBM has in the Power Seven has EDRAM on chip, yeah, right? So, so the advantage is that because you don't need high frequency in these processes anymore, right, you're going to go to one gigahertz or lower, then it's a technology that is more compatible with EDRAM. Okay. And you would have it for the last level cache, certainly. Okay, okay. yes? So, so what are the consequences of being wrong? Oh, you lose the state. That would be very bad. Very bad. So you got to profile it and be conservative, certainly. 
But remember, so the, the key is that you get millisecond level retention for many, many, many cells. Well, people now do 50 microseconds, so big difference. Let me move on. Yes, yes, Milos. No, 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 go ahead. Are there studies that look at uh, changing refresh rate and uh, behavior of the programs, how many errors you get? So you can move from a very low refresh rate to a very high refresh rate? So I, I, I can tell you that uh, companies know that there's a huge room. So they have unplugged DRAMs and put it back and still contain all the data. Okay? And what they have done also... In the meantime, they sell them to someone else? <laughs> Maybe sell them and they contain all the data and they have... So, true. So let me... Do we have time? So let me talk about the network. For the network, network... So to tolerate parameter variation, what we do is we increase the guard bands of, of the... So when do we finish here? Whenever you're done. They will stay here until you're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to try for 530 at max, or is that... Oh, I can, yeah, finish, certainly, certainly. So if you guys don't mind, then I'll take a few more minutes. So network, very important source of power. And networks... So people put guard bands, as I said before, to be able to tolerate things. And guard bands are very bad for energy efficiency. And the network is particularly vulnerable because the network connects this, this different parts of the chip. And that's very bad, okay? Because some parts of the chips are fast, others are slow. And you have to do the worst case of that. And so basically what we want to do is aggressive power savings. We want to dynamically reduce the voltage of different parts of the network while watching for errors. Okay? We're going to be aggressively reducing, cutting off all the guard bands of the network. So our approach would be to reduce the voltage for each router to the minimum okay? while continuously monitoring for errors and dynamically adapting the, the voltage that we apply to different parts of the chip then based on the error scene. Okay? And we can have then a very energy efficient design because we're going to remove the voltage margins added for variation and wear out. And we're going to rely on error detection in this case, in the net. So here's the algorithm. On error, we increase the voltage of all the routers that the message went through. Okay, so that the slowest parts of the chip have high voltage, periodically we decrease the voltage of all the routers. Okay, so here's the idea. Suppose that I have this network where I have a router, one processor per router, and the colors represent how slow the router is. So darker columns, colors mean slower, and lighter means faster. Okay, so initially I say 0.8 volts. I put this huge guard band to be safe. Then I send messages, and I find no errors, and then periodically I keep decreasing the voltage of the network, right? Because there are no errors. And then, eventually, I get to 0.6 volts. And then I send a message, and then I find that as I send the message, I find errors, okay? There is an error here, and there's an error here. Then what do I do? I have a controller that detects this, resends the message, and then it increases the voltage of all the routers in the path. Okay? And so I continuously do this, and I decrease regularly the voltage every time smaller steps. So the thing converges. Okay? And it ends up, say, conver converges to this thing. The fast processors go to 0.6. I I've increased the, sorry, I've increased here the, the voltage of this path. Okay? And eventually I get for the fast processors go to low, fast routers go to low voltage, the other ones to high voltage. Okay? So this is a, a very, potentially very effective approach because there's a lot of difference across the different routers of the chip. Okay? So here we have a 64 router torus where each node cycles at 500 megahertz. And so what we measured is the point at which the routers find an error. Okay. Each router is a three-stage router. So I'm showing here 
64 times 3, which is the three stages of the 64 routers. And for each of them, I showed you, as I decrease the voltage, what is the error, the probability of error? So some routers, as I get to 0.7 volts, they start finding errors. So for those, I don't want to go below 0.7. But some routers, some stages of some routers, because of the way where they are in the chip, you can go down to 0.7 volts and still have zero errors, some of them here. It makes sense to take advantage of this. So rather than cycling and, sorry, powering all the routers at 0.73 volts, it makes sense to be aggressive and cut down the voltage of all these routers here because they can still operate at low voltage. So that's the idea. So with this, huge savings in power. So you will pay the same cost as you have multiple VPAs in many systems. That's correct. That's a cost that we have. So you have to modulate that thing with this thing. So 10% additional power losses. So this thing comes 10%, 20%, not 20 to 30. But if you had if you had the domains, if you had the domains, you would take advantage of this. Okay, but that's true. Uh, as the first part of your presentation, you said that uh, multiple frequency domains are better than multiple voltage domains. But now you are coming back to using uh, different voltages. Why don't you try uh, different frequency for each router? Well, so that would be another approach. Reducing the frequency doesn't save as much power. Power is CV square F. The voltage is the big lever. Reducing the voltage can do much more than reducing the frequency. Frequency here is constant. We don't change the frequency. Make sense? Uh, in the first part of your presentation, why uh, do you use uh, multiple frequencies? Because in that case, I wanted to take advantage of the the variation yeah, as well. Yeah, you you could do the same thing. You could do the same thing. So yeah. as your colleague has said, you have to pay the cost of the voltage regulators here. Yeah, okay? Course. So you cut down, you remove 10% of this. Yeah. So rather than 20 to 30, it's 10 to 20. Okay? okay? But if uh, uh, I use a different uh, frequency for each router, you know what You would gain a little bit, not so much. Okay. Right? Anyway, so, but that's a good point, and, and certainly we could do this. So that gives you an idea. So let me just move on to more architectural issues. I've talked a lot about design issues. Now, at the architecture level, we want to minimize the data movement. Okay, I'll be done in a second here. So Thrifty has several techniques to minimize data movement. One of them is, of course, we organize the chip into clusters. Okay, also we have mechanisms to manage the cache hierarchy in software. So rather than relying on hardware cache coherence, our chip relies on software managed caches. So that's because the hardware oftentimes moves more data than necessary. And here we want to cut down as much as possible the power. We also have simple compute engines in the memory system called processing in memory, and we have efficient synchronization mechanisms. Okay, I'm just gonna now skip some of the slides, perhaps here. Just give you an idea of why we use software managed caches. So when the core references align, we're gonna get the data either from our own cache or from the next level of the cache hierarchy. We're not gonna bother getting the latest version of the line, okay? That's because we don't have hardware cache coherence. Instead, we get whatever we have. And writes, when a processor writes, it's not going to invalidate or update other copies of the system, only its own. That means that we have instructions in this machine to perform explicit write back and invalidate. Okay? So if you have two processors, say, that want to communicate, the way to do it is, say, this guy wrote something that this one wants to read, I need to first explicitly put in the code, write back the line to memory, and then this guy will have to explicitly invalidate its copy from the cache and then read the line. Hmm? So we do this because we want to 
minimize, we hope to minimize the data movement and not rely on the hardware to do the movement in the background. Hmm? So this is tricky to program and so we have a compiler project that tries to insert all these things. So before a synchronization, you would write back all that you have written. After the synchronization, you would invalidate everything that you will read next. Okay? So write back before the barrier, invalidate after the barrier. So we, in fact, what we really want is to have, what you write back is the right set of this processor, whatever you wrote, intersection with the read set of others in the next epoch. Whatever you wrote that will be read by other processors. All right? That's what you need to write back. And what you need to invalidate is the intersection of the right set of others in the previous epoch. Right? Intersected with whatever you're going to read in the next epoch. Because what you're going to read in the next epoch, if somebody wrote, those guys will have the most up-to-date versions and you want to miss in your cache. Anyway, just to let you know that this is kind of tricky and we hope that the compiler will do this. Okay? Moving on, we have processing in memory and the idea is to use a layer of logic under the memory to do some computation. Okay? So Micron's hybrid memory cube is a technique that is, is a memory system that Micron has just announced, or actually two years ago. And this is memory chip, multiple layers of memory, four to eight layers, and then a logic layer here. And this thing can be placed in a multi-chip module, module with processors. Hmm? And the DRAMs nowadays handle the, the storage, and these guys handle the control of the memory. But one could think of an environment where this layer of, DRAM, of logic below the DRAM could be used as a processing in memory. Okay? As you read data, it could do intelligent memory operations. For example, it could pre-process data as it is read from memory, right? or, or it could perform processor commands in place. Okay? This is lifetime employment for compiler people. Okay? To be able to identify in the codes intelligent memory operations and push them to the memory system. Reductions, you know, multiplications, and so on. Okay? And this would be done, hopefully, in this layer of logic that Micron is providing. We also support fine-grained parallelism. We have full empty bits, hardware barriers. Okay? I'm not going to bother with you with this. Okay? Overall, what we have learned is that nicely supporting Naively, naively translating programs written for coherent caches to translate them into non-coherent caches is very, very hard. And we get very inefficient code. So a great opportunity is for tools that are able to help you develop programs for non-coherent caches. Another one is that fine-grained synchronization, while nice, is very hard to do and requires completely rewriting of the programs. You need new algorithms to take advantage of fine-grained synchronization. Okay, I need two minutes more to go over programmability. Programming is going to be a challenge in this machine. It has already been a challenge for any high-end systems. Only heroes have been able to program supercomputers. Now, with the emphasis on power efficiency, it gets even worse. Why? Because we have more concurrency, and that means more parallelism. It means programmers will have to deal with more parallelism. And it means that the emphasis on minimizing, carefully minimizing communication and maximizing locality. Okay? So how do we envision the programmers to program this machine? We envision to have expert programs and naive programs. Expert programs will want all the hooks of the machine. So this machine provides hooks for voltage monitoring and voltage setting and frequency setting and what not. Hmm? And beginner programmers will want none of this. And what we have is high level programming models that express locality. Hmm? So we have two models. One is called the hierarchical tiled arrays. And here what we do is we break the computation. My colleague Professor Padua did this. 
does this, breaks the computation into tiles in a recursive manner. So people can express, especially for numerical programs, tiled systems and assign tiles to a cluster and then those tiles have tiles which are assigned to processes within the cluster. The other one is concurrent collections and the idea here is computation in data flow manner. Okay, so it's easy to program. Now how do we map this thing? That's another issue but naive programmers will want, will basically be happy with this model. And you know this is an open problem, auto-tuning and other things. Okay. So if you want to research problems, this is it. Okay. How do you program for a highly energy efficient platform? Okay. To summarize then, we presented the challenges of extreme scale computing, okay. designing these machines from the ground up, from energy efficiency. We described some of the architecture and design ideas that, that we have. Okay. So we have, I have many students working on those. To so these problems, we already have solutions. You're welcome to think about other problems. Okay. Programmability may suffer, and that's why we need to focus on programming systems. And also, there's a trade-off that Miloš already alluded between energy efficiency and resiliency. I didn't have time to explain this thing, but as we decrease the voltage, we start having errors. And there's a trade-off between the two. Okay. How much can we tolerate in terms of errors for how much power efficiency? Okay, thank you. Other questions? Any other questions? Um, so you discussed a lot about reducing leakage power for you know, the memory modules, but in terms of the leakage of the processors themselves, um, temperature is a really important issue here because the temperature increases the static power dissipation. So do any of the constructs you guys have for distributing computation among the processes, do they take this into account when they try to even out the temperature gradient by not? For instance, if you have a set of these clusters that are particularly well suited in terms of their frequencies or not, or even application, does it only you know, distribute among those clusters or does it also take into account the other ones? Okay, so... Anyone hear the question? Yeah. I'll summarize. What about temperature? <laughs> 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 Okay, so, okay, high level, high level answer. We don't worry too much about temperature because we look at near threshold voltage, okay? So these chips actually don't work at 80 or 90 or 100 degrees. They work at 50 or less, okay? So that's one thing, but, but you mentioned a very important problem, which is the temperature. Leakage is exponential with temperature. So for conventional technologies, Managing temperature is very important to reduce leakage. Okay, so we don't do anything but what you mentioned, scheduling the work to, to um, make uniform temperatures, then is very important. Other questions? Any? Do you have any concerns when VDD, do you have any concerns when VDD is less than the voltage, the voltage control? Threshold voltage, okay, so some people in Michigan in particular are working on lower, even lower voltage, it's called sub-threshold voltage, okay. So there, it turns out that the speed suffers a lot. So exponentially, you, you, you're able to basically become slower and slower, okay. It turns out that the optimal performance or energy per unit of performance, it seems the optimal is in sub-threshold but it comes at a cost, a big cost in performance. So maybe for medical devices, it's a good idea where you really, really want to have low, low power, but it's very low performance. So for the near threshold uh, computing, you set the supply voltage to uh, a little uh, beyond the, uh, this threshold voltage, but uh, it still has the scalability problem, right? Because it doesn't scale with the uh, feature size either. 
So what's so the question? Can you, so can you comment on the scalability of the near threshold computing with the feature size? Right, so people are working very hard on technologies where you can reduce the threshold voltage. Okay, so, so people will decrease that. And, um, you know, I'm not a device person, but I know that there are people working on the ability for a transistor to dynamically change the threshold voltage. And so that would mean that would mean that whenever I need the performance, it goes down. Whenever I don't need it, it goes up. Okay. Thank you.